Hello and welcome to this lecture of the course elements of mechanical vibrations. Having discussed the free and forced vibrations of a typical 2 degree of freedom system, uh, in this lecture we will devote some time to understand what a vibration absorber is all about and how designing this vibration absorber can help us control vibrations, particularly resonant vibrations of a typical vibratory system. Okay, so, this is what uh, is going to look like the response of um, mass m1 and that of mass m2 and what we observed is that there are two resonances which are uh, going to appear at these two speed ratios which are expected because there are two degrees of freedom. But what is uh, interesting is this position where the mass m1 of the two um, masses would have its response 0 and that happens when the numerator becomes 0 which actually means that when the speed ratio is equal to square root of 3. That is precisely the location where the amplitude of the parent uh, of the first mass x1 will be equal to 0 and at that instant or at that speed the second mass will also have uh, its amplitude uh, quite small. So, uh, over a range of these frequencies, the amplitude is going to be uh, quite small. So, this particular feature is now exploited um, for the design of vibration absorber and that is precisely uh, the point of discussion today. So, what we are going to look at is um, is a system, a vibratory system which we now uh, define as this is our system. This is something which I will call as a primary system or a main vibratory system having its mass m and stiffness k subjected to external forcing function. We assume a harmonic excitation to this parent mass and we have seen that this response x of t would have of course, two resonances, but then it would have zero amplitude somewhere there and another resonance uh, slightly on the right side. But it is this location in frequency where the amplitude of mass m which is our uh, parent system or a main system would become zero and that is many times required. We would like our uh, main vibratory system to have as, as low amplitude of vibration as possible and that would happen if we somehow attach this additional or many times called as an auxiliary system to the parent system which um, if it is properly tuned in the sense that if its uh, stiffness and mass properties are properly adjusted, uh, you might uh, you know get a situation where your parent system or the main mass m would have zero amplitude of vibration. That is basically the uh, whole philosophy. This 2 degree of freedom system is quite similar to this um, 2 degree of freedom system which we have discussed wherein uh, the amplitude are actually uh, turning out to be zero here um, and of course quite low in uh, for the second mass. But the first mass amplitude of vibration can be brought to 0 and this is what we plan to do uh, in designing um, something called as vibration absorber. Okay. So, what we do here we assume now that, that our system actually is um, a simple vibratory system having its uh, spring and mass properties which you can extract from the actual physical system and this is subjected to a harmonic forcing function or external excitation f of t um, and because this system would have its frequency characteristic like this which means that it will have a resonance frequency somewhere here and uh, you would argue that if it has a resonance frequency here which you already know why do not you operate it here so that the vibration amplitudes are small. Okay. 
yes it, indeed it can be done but many times in practice you try to design it maybe about 15 20% away and for some reason um, during manufacturing or installation the actual frequency might slightly shift and becomes very close to the operating condition right so it is quite possible and therefore this vibration absorber is many times is an as an afterthought or can be implemented on site when the system is installed so let us um, not worry too much about why we are not having its operating speed away from resonance but supposing that it it has to operate at that speed and uh, somehow we are staring at resonance condition uh, in that situation let us look at how we can contain the vibrations and minimize the vibration even if it is vibrating at um, frequency omega which is close to the natural frequency omega n of the parent vibratory system now having said this what we do is we attach an auxiliary system as we are seeing here in this particular case this auxiliary system is um, is appropriately designed so that um, the system or uh, the parent system the, the main system has its vibration amplitude zero now obviously the initial uh, response of the parent system or the main system is this by the, the moment we attach this additional system to it the system no more is a single degree of freedom system obviously right so now it turns into a two degree of freedom system just the way we have seen in the previous slide so this has its own response amplitude and this has its own response this may be um, x and this this uh, let me say as x1 okay both as a function of time now instead of this single resonance what is going to happen is that the moment I attach this auxiliary system to the main system the system turns two degree of freedom system and then I do have now two natural frequencies and therefore two resonances okay so I am replacing one problem with two problems that there are two resonances possible because now there are two degrees of freedom however if my operating speed cannot be changed from here okay which means that i have an i have a machinery which operates at a constant speed which most of the times is the case right if you are um, if your air conditioning system uh, with the com with the condenser unit operating with a fan which is operating at a constant speed you don't change that speed of the fan right so if it operates at a constant speed at least at its operating speed range i am spared from large amplitudes of vibration right so by attaching an additional uh, auxiliary system to the parent system i am splitting the original uh, resonance um, or natural frequency in two split natural frequencies that means there uh, the the middle one gets split into two and one is uh, omega n1 which is basically the first natural frequency and this one the second natural frequency two masses two natural frequencies right but what is happening is um, if my operating speed is 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 here i do not no more have this kind of a resonant condition okay of course as long as i operate in this speed range only okay so this is basically the the, the philosophy of designing a vibration absorber um, so that at the operating speed which is close to resonance the vibration amplitudes are contained to a reasonably low level theoretically zero okay how does that happen partly we have already seen that happening in the previous uh, slide here where we have seen already that because this curve passes through this point there is a zero reason a zero amplitude uh, condition there okay let's look at this a uh, little more carefully uh, through the equations so we now take into account the natural frequency of the main system so this is our the main natural frequency square root of k over m and that itself is the excitation frequency will it not because we are con considering a situation where your operating speed is close to the natural frequency and therefore there are resonant vibrations which is the reason why you are trying to 
design a vibration absorber. So, we have a situation where the excitation frequency is close to the natural frequency uh, and that natural frequency is given by square root of k over m. We define this uh, zero frequency deflection as f over k where f is the magnitude of the excitation force and k is the stiffness of the of the parent system or a main system. Okay? And that basically is to uh, help us get the non-dimensional curves of response. Okay, then we define uh, another natural frequency, in this case the natural frequency of the attached auxiliary system. Okay? This system is, is going to be attached to the parent system and if I consider this to be an individual vibratory system, single degree of freedom vibratory system, before I attach it to this, then its natural frequency uh, is defined as q which is equal to square root of k1 by m1 because if I considering this, this as a, a separate single degree of freedom vibratory system having its own mass and own stiffness, then the natural frequency of this system q is going to be square root of k1 by m. Okay? The moment I attach, there is nothing like p and q separate, both of them together is now a 2 degree of freedom system which will, which will have its own natural frequencies. Okay? So, there will be p1 and p2 or uh, omega n1 and omega n2, those two natural frequencies of a 2 degree of freedom system. However, we have here discussed two different system, one parent system having its own stiffness k and m and auxiliary system or an attached absorber system whose uh, own stiffness and mass are m, uh, k1 and m1 respectively. We introduce another important parameter okay, which is mu and this mu is, is the mass ratio and defined as the mass of the auxiliary system to the mass of the main system. So, you, you, you basically uh, take the ratio of the absorber mass and the original uh, parent system mass m. Okay? Now, you would realize that this parameter is going to play a very important role in the design of this absorber. Well, with this, if I substitute the assumed solution again, uh, this is so routine that I do not really need to discuss a lot about this. Uh, you assume an, uh, a harmonic response or a solution to this governing equation of motion which we have already seen in a uh, few slides back, uh, x to be x cos omega t and x1 to be capital X1 cos omega t. Okay? And because the excitation frequency is omega, the response is also at omega. The damping is not there, so therefore I am not including the, the phase um, in the assumed solution. If you substitute these, um, these assumed solutions in the governing equations which uh, already we have discussed, then the expression uh, for the response of the main mass turns out to be this, which also we have discussed few slides back. And uh, similarly, the response of this, this auxiliary system or an absorber system is capital X1 which is, um, which is also given. So, this is capital X1 is given by this expression. Both these expressions are quite similar except that K1, K2 are now replaced as K and K1. Then there is absolutely no difference here. Now, we already know um, because we have uh, these expressions and we have assumed this X of T to be F over K. I can uh, non-dimensionalize this particular equation by appropriately, uh, you know, arranging the that taking k out from this denominator and then using uh, the expression uh, of mass ratio. I can actually uh, get this x non-dimensionalized as x over x s t given by this expression. Okay. Now, you will realize that because q has been defined like this and p has been defined like this, the uh, p and q will appear in this expression. So, you can leisurely uh, see how this can be uh, transformed into this equation. 
Now that's a simple math mathematics which we are not, uh, you know, going to deal with here at the, at the moment. Uh, but let us look at this expression in more detail. What the, what is this expression, ex, you know, telling us? Yes, what can we say about this expression? Can you say something about this expression? It it obviously, if you look at the numerator, x will be zero if the numerator is zero. And when will it be zero? When omega, or I must say, when q is equal to omega. And because omega, we are considering uh, close to the, the natural frequency of the parent system, this is equal to p. In, in effect, it actually means that if I design the absorber, okay, this absorber is quantified or characterized by its own natural frequency q and this parent system has, has it can be characterized in terms of its natural frequency p. What this equation tells us, okay is that if you design this vibration absorber with its natural frequency equal to the natural frequency of the parent system, you can expect the amplitude of vibration of the parent system becoming zero. This mathematically is quite obvious from this expression, okay? which means I must somehow manage to get the stiffness and mass together in such a ratio that the value of its natural frequency of the attached absorber equals that of the parent system natural frequency when the absorber was not attached to it. Okay? That is basic philosophy of the design of an undamped vibration absorber. Okay? And, uh, and ensuring this q is equal to p, that activity is nothing but tuning the vibration absorber uh, so that the parent system vibration amplitude capital X is equal to 0. Okay. Now, what happens to the second mass? We have discussed, okay, the capital X, which is the response of the parent system that is brought to zero. What happens to the second uh, mass, that is the absorber mass? Well, if, if I uh, do the same uh, changes to this expression of the absorber displacement amplitude, by rearranging some of those terms, I get uh, the expression here quite similar to the first mass vibration response. Okay? Now, in this case, obviously, there is no way you get the vibration amplitude 0. Right? So, and that you have um, probably seen in the graph that was, uh, you know, mentioned here, where the vibration amplitude actually is, is not 0, it is some low level amplitude. And that amplitude corresponding to the case where uh, omega is equal to p is some small value. Okay? So, when it is tuned and when omega is equal to p is equal to q, you can show that this capital X1 over XST, when it is tuned, um, then it turns out to be like minus uh, k upon k1, isn't it? because this part will be equal to 0, because when you set omega equal to q equal to p, this term becomes 0 and then you are left with this expression, is not it? And what is your response of the absorber? We have assumed it to be capital X cos p t, uh, sorry cos omega t, sorry x 1. So, now if I replace this x 1 from the top equation, then it is basically minus of k upon k1 xst. Now, I can replace xst. What is xst? That is f by k. Is it not? Cos omega t. And so, I can write this as minus f over k1 cos omega t. This is the dynamic response of the, sorry, this is not x, this is x1. I must write. Okay, the response of the 
absorber the second system that you are attaching to the primary system and uh, so okay let, let, let me write this as a uh, little clearly minus f over k1 cos omega t please make a note that it is negative what does that mean well the, that graph you show i mean you saw that it, it was all in that range where the parent system changes from negative to positive here the this this amplitude was negative if you recall that point right that is what that is what it is right but the amplitude is then going to be f over k1 and it is going to harmonically oscillate so <clears throat> the point here is that you are attaching another external system to the parent vibratory system bringing down the vibration of the parent system to zero and letting the attached absorber system to vibrate with whatever small amplitude okay if i use this equation the denominator equal to zero what will you get hmm? if i plot this x1 upon xst right you would get it this way and then there will be this kind of a response and likewise okay this is your response of the absorber system now these are the two resonant frequencies where the absorber will have large amplitudes and of course that those are also the frequencies at which the parent system will vibrate with large amplitudes now if i solve the denominator equal to zero which means that x1 will have infinite amplitude theoretically these are the two natural frequencies omega n1 and omega n2 in this case this will be like resonant frequencies and those two frequencies can be obtained by solving the denominator equal to zero isn't it that's what we have seen a uh, few slides back when we discussed two degree of freedom system so this equation is also similar to that equation except that i have um, replaced some terms here uh, by the mass ratio mu okay now please try to understand here that um, p is equal to what square root of k over m isn't it this is the natural frequency of the parent system what is the natural frequency of the auxiliary system or an absorber system this is k1 by m1 and what condition have we assumed here that originally the parent system is is having resonance condition at at p so omega is equal to p okay and then we attached and tuned the vibration absorber to match the absorber natural frequency to the parent natural frequency so therefore if this condition has been already assumed then can we say that k over m is equal to k1 over m1 if p is equal to q k upon m is equal to k1 upon m1 what does that mean that means k1 upon k is equal to m1 upon m which we have already defined as the mass ratio okay so in this expression of denominator k1 by k is replaced by mu the mass ratio and therefore this becomes now the frequency equation and the solution of this frequency equation gives you the two resonant frequencies omega n1 omega n2 or you can uh, you can also write this simply as omega 1 and omega 2 the two natural frequencies of the two degree of freedom system okay and we will be using this equation um, in the design of this vibration absorber
design in in the sense this is already designed right the moment you match these two natural frequencies the design is that way over except for small uh, issues which we will discuss is this clear now okay and this is the expression if you solve this equation this is what the expression for the two natural frequencies or two resonant frequencies that we get. Um, if you know or use the mass ratio mu, um, then the two natural frequencies can be easily obtained. Now, a, a small uh, discussion is in store about uh, what, what role is played by this mu. Okay? So, what I am going to show here is the way so, this is omega normalized with respect to, so omega 1 and omega 2 which I get from this equation is normalized with respect to the natural frequency of the parent system and then I plot them here. Okay? Now, by using uh, plus and minus sign, I get obviously two frequencies. So, let us assume that I have, I have chosen this mass ratio equal to 0 0.1. So, at this value of mass ratio, I get these two natural frequencies or these two resonant frequencies. One is this, the, sec the second one, the lower one of the two is this. Okay? And it is expected because original uh, when there is a zero mass ratio, what does that zero mass ratio mean? m1 by m. So, that means there is no m, m as there is no m1, there is no auxiliary system. So, obviously, when mu is equal to 0, you have uh, omega n is equal to p, that is your parent system. The moment you attach this absorber system to your parent vibratory system, the moment you attach this auxiliary absorber system, this you know changes the, the single degree of freedom into two degree of freedom and then you have these two natural frequencies split. One will have a larger of the two which is more than the original one, the lower one will be smaller than the original single degree of freedom natural frequency. Okay? Now, the question is what value of mass ratio should I choose? Yes. So, supposing if I plot this original resonance plot, okay, I have this um, natural frequency plot, sorry, uh, post response plot which is showing resonance here. What I am basically getting uh, is that by attaching the absorber, this is how the system changes, isn't it? Now, I was, I was happy that by attaching the absorber, I am sitting here and I can enjoy zero amplitude condition, operating condition, right? But you all know and from the practical experience, there would be slight deviation in the operating speed. You cannot expect the load changes, the speed drops, the load reduces, the speed, you know, slightly increases and therefore, if by chance, if you go away from this operating condition, little far off from this point, then you would be close to the one of the two resonances, is not it? And usually, these differences will not be, this difference will not be uh, significantly large that you can enjoy uh, a, a long operating sp speed range. And why is that so? Because if you look at this mu and you attach a larger m1, that means you attach a larger mass, you know, uh, which causes this mu to be larger, you can definitely enjoy a much wider difference in these two frequencies. So, this delta omega would be larger, as you can see, these two frequencies are split and the difference between the, the lower one and the upper one is, is 
reasonably uh, wide right isn't it so you can uh, you can then stretch your legs and have the operating speed to deviate reasonably well okay if you have a smaller mu which means that a smaller mass was attached you have an issue here that the gap between the two new resonances uh, reduces and a slight deviation would uh, would cause larger amplitudes uh, the moment you deviate far off from the uh, original operating speed what is the problem in then selecting larger and a higher value of mu first thing is that these curves are flattening out that means any increase in the value of m1 is not going to fetch you a reasonably wide frequency uh, split okay and then number two which is more important is nobody would allow you to attach a heavier mass nobody will allow you to attach a heavier mass to the parent system you know your original vibratory system any attachment of mass means it's going to add to the mass of uh, your system which is which is uh, definitely not uh, taken lightly or is not in fact allowed or uh, people will object to that and this is not a real uh, correct design so you would uh, really re like to have as small mu as possible okay while ensuring a reasonable split and reasonable a range of operating operation around your operating speed omega okay so therefore this mu is actually selected so that you have a reasonable uh, operating speed range while ensuring that the attached vibration absorber is not heavy enough okay so it should be as light as possible you can have k um, designed appropriately but uh, any mass which you put there is always going to be um, a problem uh, of, a, of a proper design right so this is the the part that we basically have to uh, keep in mind that uh, mu is to be kept as small as possible uh, so that the absorber system is not bulky if you thought that these are all only in in, in theory uh, this is one example of such vibration absorber actually uh, implemented in uh, one of the uh, skyscraper this is uh, you all might be knowing uh, Taipei 101 building in I1 and the earthquakes there are commonplace and the designers wanted to limit the vibrations subjected to such uh, excitations at the base so what they basically installed designed and installed uh, a pendulum absorber on some top floors uh, whose uh, design was essentially you know inspired from these basic vibration uh, you know fundamentals that we discussed just now so this pendulum starts oscillating the moment the building starts vibrating at its natural frequency and uh, the design is um, is is perfectly working it's uh, you know, I would suggest that you see the YouTube videos where uh, the the recordings at the actual earthquake uh, cases uh, are available for you to see how this pendulum you know swings and uh, damps the vibration of uh, the building the other examples that I would like to discuss here is uh, the setup that we have couple of setups that we have in the lab so this particular setup was uh, you know shown to you some time back where uh, a beam which is hinged uh, at this point uh, is a, as such a single degree of freedom vibratory system with the motor sitting uh, somewhere here and then there is a spring at um, at the other extreme uh, essentially um, simulating a, a simple single degree of freedom system so it is sub supported by by a spring at the tip here and if i rotate this uh, disc which has an unbalance located um, it excites this beam and uh, the forced vibration response of this simple system you can view that here okay so the beam is oscillating about the hinge on the extreme left 
and we have a reflective tape here to enable us to find out what is the speed at which the beam uh, at which the the disc with an unbalance is uh, rotating so you can see currently the vibrate the rotational speed is close to 200 and we will set it to resonant condition that means we will set this operation speed the speed of rotation to match with the natural frequency of this uh, setup and you would you would now see that the amplitudes become very large as the vibrations are going to be reaching a very large value the moment i bring the speed um, so if i bring the speed to a smaller value and uh, then yes as as you can see now the amplitudes are really becoming very large it's the the, the speed at which the uh, the beam uh, oscillations become very lar large so 160 165 is the uh, in revolutions per minute is the speed mind you the motor is operating at much higher speed because there is a gearbox which reduces the speed um, of the disc the discs are operating at reasonably low um, speeds of rotation now what we do here is suppose this uh, this system is representing a typical practical vibratory system and i am supposed to operate it at this speed i don't have a choice of changing the speed then i can still make it work and uh, with a lo uh, lot less vibration amplitude by attaching um, a, a small absorber system so what you now notice is that to this uh, motor and the beam we have attached a, a, a small spring here and we shall see how attachment of this absorber system brings down the vibration amplitude uh, to a reasonably low level so again we bring it to resonance so i am going to bring the, uh, the the speed again between 160 to 165 or so uh, so that you can visually see large amplitudes and the spring is already attached here the only thing that is missing is the mass now we actually did calculations that if this 160 rpm which is going to be close to 2.7 hertz or so um, and the spring stiffness was was measured and for that spring stiffness what should be the mass to be attached and in the mass turned out to be close to 580 or so grams and then th that mass was then attached to the spring and let us see how what happens when an absorber and gets attached to this parent system uh, whether the amplitudes really come down uh, as we expect from theory so let me see if i yeah here it is so actually there are there are stoppers here which limit the vibration of the beam and we one can actually listen to the third sound when it starts hitting the stoppers now what you not notice that uh, we are putting attaching a mass carefully calibrated so that the natural frequency of this this attached spring mass okay is same as the natural frequency of the parent system or the operating speed that is 165 now you can see that um, the parent system which was oscillating vigorously has been quietened a lot okay again uh, slight vibrations are seen because the speed got back again to a larger value so the moment you get back to the same speed of operation you can see that the beam is almost uh, stationary uh, hardly uh, any vibrations are noticed if you maintain the speed same you can definitely see a significant drop in the amplitude of vibration which if you compare it with what uh, you saw in the in the previous slide where it was large oscillations were seen uh, this definitely is much quieter as you compare this uh, with what we had and now what what we have here okay so this is uh, how we implement this theory that we learned uh, to practice of course in a lab environment but 
you have seen one practical applications where they have managed to get the vibrations uh, in that building to a very small value. Now, another example that we have in the lab is, uh, is imitating a multi, uh, multi floor building. So, this of course, we cannot go to 101 floors. We have managed to have uh, maybe three floors here, one, uh, second and third and uh, it, is, it is mounted on a base which you can see here and this base is excited by an electrodynamic shaker. So, this is a shaker horizontally placed and that shaker has a piston that, that oscillates uh, at, a, at a given frequency and amplitude. So, the base of this whole building is harmonically moved back and forth and you can set the frequency to match with one of the natural frequency of this setup uh, so that you can uh, you know explore with, uh, whether the vibration absorber work or not. So, um, what we have uh, done is uh, you, you can see um, an arrangement here at the top floor where something similar to what the IPI building has. So, it is essentially a pendulum having uh, an effective length which is equal to this, a mass which is uh, bolted here, the length here is, is properly calibrated. So, again what we do is because the natural frequency of the pendulum, you can find out what should be the length so that this is equal to one of the natural frequencies of this multi floor uh, apparatus, right. So, this L, uh, the length at which this, this mass is uh, connected uh, is is properly uh, calibrated so that the natural frequency of this pendulum matches with one of the natural frequencies of the system. Now, you can see uh, what, uh, how this actually can bring down the vibration amplitudes. So, okay. So, this is basically uh, to show you how the pendulum uh, actually acts. It is a simple um, strip with a mass at the end and the length um, properly. So, the slot basically helps you to uh, tune the, the, the position of the mass or fix the position of the mass and tune the frequency close to the uh, resonant frequency. So, it will be shown that uh, by removing this absorber, uh, the entire building vibrates at its uh, first natural frequency and then the moment you uh, put this absorber or an, um, uh, uh, an auxiliary system, uh, the amplitude can be uh, is actually brought to 0. So, you, by removing this, you can see very clearly how the shaker is shaking the base. It is just like earthquake moving the base of or foundation of the building. And you can see now this entire multi degree of freedom system is rocking with large amplitudes of vibration. The first fundamental mode is very clearly seen. All the masses or all the floors are moving in the same phase. And now uh, I, I just put, you just put this pendulum, see the pendulum starts swinging and the parent system amplitude quite close to 0. Okay? Of course, in the actual um, building, you must have seen there were uh, there were uh, dampers, uh, if you recall. Uh, maybe you can have a look at some of the videos on the on the web. So these are the these are the uh, the dampers that that you will see there, right? So this is not an undamped vibration absorber, but uh, but you do have some dampers there and. And there are reasons why we 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 use or sometimes we'll have to use uh, you know damping elements. Okay, so this is basically how the vibration absorbers are to be designed to control the vibrations. the The basic philosophy there is to design the parameters of the attached absorber system uh, in a way that its natural frequency comes close to the natural frequency of the parent system. Okay, now let us solve a problem just to get a feel of what this design is all about. Uh, this example is of uh, an engine, an automotive uh, uh, engine. Uh, the crankshaft uh, is connected to the flywheel. Uh, the engine 
generates a torque which is given here so let's let's go one by one the engine is connected to a flywheel uh, the flywheel inertia uh, is 70 um, kg square meters whereas the engine itself has a inertia here ie uh, is equal to 0 0.735 kg square meter whereas this one is comparatively much higher and the engine is subjected to a torque so the, the excitation torque here is 294 newton meter okay at 100 radians per second so your excitation frequency is 1000 radians per second that is what has been given and the amplitude of the excitation torque is 294 now here we are talking of torsional vibratory system not a normal linear uh, vibratory system which we have been uh, seeing so this is nothing but um, a torsional vibration you know to be to be uh, to be solved for so for reducing the torsional vibrations at the operating frequency an arrangement of torsional vibration absorber it is, is designed now that design is shown here this is your torsional vibration absorber so it is in the form of a, well it is in the form of a, a bar uh, in the center this particular part is uh, is aligned to the axis of this crankshaft okay and this is uh, you know constrained from oscillating about this axis by these four springs so these springs are basically going to resist any oscillatory motion of this bar okay so this bar is like in the slots of this engine or an extension of that engine so that that mass that inertial mass swings about this axis okay and the oscillation of that mass or that link is restrained by uh, two springs on either side okay so the moment there is an excitation uh, in the torsional sense the springs will try to resist and bring it back to its original uh, equilibrium position this is how um, the absorber is to be designed the absorber is tuned to the excitation frequency and you are supposed to design the inertia of the absorber that means you are supposed to find out what should be the value of mass moment of inertia of this absorber that we should have and what should be uh, the spring rate of these four springs so that the resonance frequencies are at least 20 percent away from the excitation frequency so basically what we are trying to ensure that once you have two split torsional natural frequencies or resonance frequencies corresponding to the original operating 1000 radians per second here this um, the drop in the first one should be 20 percent away from the original one and this upper one should be again 20 percent up above the original 1000 radians per second excitation frequency so that you have a reasonable uh, you know frequency range to operate so that is what the problem statement is okay now if i try to uh, you know see this particular system similar to what uh, system that we have uh, discussed in the previous slide um, i can immediately see that this flywheel inertia is very large too big 10 times large and we have seen in one of the explanation that if the you know the stiffness ratio or one stiffness is too high or one mass is too high compared to the other one i can ignore or i can assume this flywheel to be almost like a rigid one the moment i consider the flywheel to be the rigid one then this torsional stiffness of the crankshaft connecting the engine to the flywheel can be treated like a spring okay so this is like k and it is connected to the engine inertia right so this engine inertia is nothing but this mass 
and for us the primary system is this this shaft and the engine that is our primary system to which you are connecting an absorber system and there the absorber is this particular link so this is the absorber and this stiffness k1 so let me keep the notations the same and write here as m1 now m1 is nothing but the inertia of this particular link and k1 represents the combined uh, stiffness of these four springs which is going to be the uh, you know the resisting elements for the free torsional motion of the link so it actually means that this is my primary system and this my absorber system the absorber system is all shown here okay it's just that that absorber is compactly sitting in the frame of the engine or it can be an extension of that that frame but basically by assuming the flywheel to be large and assuming it to be rigid enough i am making an assumption here that i can i can treat this particular system as a primary system and the absorber inside the engine to be uh, a free vibratory system which is an absorber system okay this is how i convert the actual physical system into its simplified vibratory model okay coming back to our basic vibration analysis all right now the engine torque is 294 newton meter and we are supposed to design the absorber what would you do now to design the vibration absorber um, our basic philosophy is that the vibration nat natural frequency of the absorber should be same as the natural frequency of the parent system which is the operating speed okay we are trying to ensure that at that resonance the amplitudes are brought to zero now this omega is already given it operates at 1000 radians per second so the moment i know that 1000 radians per second is the omega value which is to be equated to what the value of kt okay the stiffness of the shaft is also given no 7.35 into 10 raised to power 5 newton meter newton meter per radian that is the stiffness of the shaft and that is the parent system right so it is k over i e so this is basically the engine inertia okay now um, so you can find out uh, from this uh, in fact this is your uh, the natural frequency of the parent system right square root of k over i e and this p is is equal to square root of 7.35 into 10 raised to power 5 and divided by the engine inertia is 0 0.735 okay one can find this out and that is obviously is, is close to 1000 uh, it is in fact equal to 1000 radians per second all right we would be interested in knowing what is the value of what value of mass ratio should we use so m1 over m which in this particular case of torsional vibratory system instead of mass we always talk of the inertia of the absorber and that of engine is it not now we do not know that right because we are not still uh, in fact this uh, the absorbers inertia is what we want to find out so this is not known what about the engine inertia yes engine inertia is known as 0 0.735 but i do not know mu in fact i would like to know what is mu so the other way of uh, trying to resolve this is uh, recalling that our frequency equation of a two mass system remember that frequency equation yes here it is this was our frequency equation you can either use this or you you can use this we would solve or we will use this for the sake of convenience okay now what we do i might uh, as well as 
use this omega by p as a, a ratio. Now, you may notice that it has been given that the new natural frequencies or new resonance frequencies should be at least 20 percent away from the excitation frequency. So, which actually means that omega 1 expected should be 0 0.8 times uh, omega and omega 2 should be 1.2 times omega uh, and because omega is equal to p. So, this is nothing but writing 0 0.8 times p and this is 1.2 times p. So, what actually happens is that these two ratios omega 1 by p uh, is equal to 0 0.8 and omega 2 by p is equal to 1.2. So, what I do 1 plus mu minus 0 0.8 square and 1 minus 0 0.8 square minus mu equal to 0. This is the, the first equation that I have if I choose the lower of the two new natural frequencies. And the second one will be obviously 1 plus mu minus 1.2 square 1 minus 1.2 square minus mu equal to 0. This be becomes the one the second one. So, these two equations if I solve I get uh, the value of mu. Obviously, I can get it from the first itself I do not need the second one. No? So, if you solve this if you solve this the value of mu that you get would be 0 0.202 or so. So, you get two different values of mu from by solving these equations. Now, which one will you use? Now, they are of course, very close. So, would not matter a lot, but uh, you know if they turn out to be uh, reasonably far apart, then you will have to choose which one of the two will you use, right. So, which one will you prefer, the bigger one or a smaller one? Hmm? The bigger one has to be chosen, why? Because the smaller one, so 0 0.19 would give you this, these two different values of the two natural frequencies and the 0 0.2 will give you little wider one. The, the point is if you design it based on this, sorry if you design it based on this it will, it will satisfy, um, it will satisfy this um, higher one okay, when you are operating at a higher of the two resonances, uh, but it may not uh, suffice for the required value of mu. Uh, for the lower uh, uh, resonance frequency. So, uh, 0 0.202 is the mass ratio that you have to use so that it satisfies uh, the requirement of uh, at, at both the resonances. So, therefore, now that I have uh, I have decided or I have evaluated the value of uh, mu which is 0 0.202. I now have um, the relationship where I e and the mass ratio are known. I e is already 0 0.735 and therefore, I a can be calculated. Okay? And you know that mu is also k 1 by k, okay? which means that this is equal to or basically 0 0.202 is equal to um, the value of k 1 over k that that k is that of the parent system which is going to be the the torsional stiffness of the shaft okay which is um, 7.35 to the power 5. So, from this I can get the stiffness um, of the absorber the only problem is this stiffness is representing the total stiffness which is this stiffness, but the, the physical construction here, the physical construction here of the absorber is a bit um, 
complex that way not as complex but it 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 is uh, comprising this particular link which is restrained at the top and here by the springs now look at this absorber system as a spring mass system no so if you assume the the engine to be fixed and the absorber to be swinging against the fixed um, engine okay? it's like saying that if this mass is fixed this is the engine mass and now i try to figure out the the value of q for the attached absorber system so now if 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 this uh, link swings by an angle theta here right it swings by an angle theta and then it keeps on swinging about this axis what is its natural frequency q we have to come up with a governing equation right so again free body diagram now i will use a little simpler um, shape of this hinged here and then there is a spring here there is a spring here and all the spring con uh, constants are assumed the same identical springs okay what will happen if i assume clockwise theta and theta double dot can i write the governing equation of this torsional vibratory system yep i theta double dot plus okay what will that be if you if you really look at the uh, newton second law i theta double dot is mass times acceleration equal to all the restoring forces external forces to that free body which are in the same direction as that of the acceleration now the moment it turns theta positive here this spring is going to get compressed this spring is going to get compressed by how much distance it will depend upon how much is this distance so now if i assume this distance to be a now please make a note that this a is already given to you so if this stiffness is is assumed as uh, ks and all the springs are identical so they are all ks here then what happens the restoring force acting the restoring force acting here against any theta angle okay this spring is going to be to be getting compressed so it will also apply a restoring force which is going to be how much yep that restoring force is going to be uh, of course proportional to ks and how much is the extension in the spring that is going to be a into theta the slight tilt and a is the the length right so that the stretch in the spring or a compression in the spring is going to be a theta now this a theta is going to be same here will be same here and the extension in these two springs that is this spring and this spring so this spring is going to be again uh, although it is ge getting ex extended and therefore it gets stretched it will it will it will try to restore its position so what i'm showing here is that this spring is also going to uh, restore its position uh, the position of the link and therefore this force is also going to act in the leftward direction or counter clockwise direction is that clear likewise you may very clearly see that all the springs are going to generate a counter clockwise restoring force on the link the moment link tries to turn clockwise all the four springs are going to try and tilt it back to its original position and the force value is going to be same ks into a theta ks is the spring stiffness at all these four contact points and therefore the force is going to be four times ks into a theta combined effect of all the four springs can be this much now these are all the forces only so the moments will be multiplied by what right and the most important of all is 
what is the direction of these that is counterclockwise opposite to the theta double dot. So, this is how the equation governing equation of this absorber system will be. So, now if I write this as and now the absorber we know that the links inertia if I sorry if I call that as I a theta double dot plus 4 k s just to keep it different from k and k 1 um, a square theta equal to 0 that is your governing equation. Now, if this is the governing equation what is the value of q the natural frequency of the absorber system it is going to be 4 k s a square upon i a. What should be the value of q for the absorber to work? We already know that it should be 1000 radians per second equal to p or equal to omega. Now, if I equate this to square root of 4 k s it is not known a is already given as 0 0.15 this see this one and divided by i a. Now, i a I will be already getting it from here and that is equal to i e which is 0 0.735 times 0 0.202 okay? that is the value of i a and so the only unknown here is the value of the spring stiffness which I get from here. This is how I design the vibration absorber. Okay? I hope it is not too complicated here, but this is the process that you will follow for finding out the relevant parameters of the vibration absorber. In this case, a torsional vibration absorber to be used in the engine to reduce the twist in the uh, shaft connecting the engine with the flywheel. That is what we should be checking. What will be the, the amplitude with which this, this absorber oscillate because that sometimes can be very useful or important to find. What is the theta of the absorber link? This is that absorber link that I am talking about. You remember what was the expression for x sorry x 1 t just flip few slides back it was f by k 1 cos omega t minus of course I am not using negative sign here I am interested in the, the amplitude f f by k 1 cos omega t now again if I am in, uh, interested in, is on, in only the amplitude then I can write this as now in this torsional vibratory case it is the external torque okay, the engine torque that is relevant upon k1 and k1 in my case is going to be what ks 4 ks a square huh? because the effective spring stiffness torsional stiffness is going to be 4 times ks into a square right cos omega t why why finding out theta a is important L look at it now from the design perspective yeah what will you gain by trying to figure out what is theta a when these springs are in action theta a into a will be the total stretch in the springs okay? and that will also help you to find out that if this engine is operating at that speed for uh, maybe 5 years uh, whether the springs will have enough amount of endurance to sustain for so much number of oscillations or not. Okay, all of these are basically the implications of this vibration on the design robustness. Okay. To summarize this lecture, we had discussed how the design of an undamped vibration absorber uh, is all about and how is that done, what are the parameters required, the condition required 
uh, we also understood the importance of mass ratio in the design of vibration absorber and uh, that, that part should be kept in mind while designing the vibration absorber and that itself um, you know gives an idea that uh, there are some challenges in the practical implementation of this undamped vibration absorber which we will try to sort out uh, in the subsequent lecture on tuned mass damper. These are the recall questions that you may try and attempt based on the contents of today's lecture. And these are the answers.